I first came to Auschwitz uh, right after I finished being ambassador in Austria in 1988. It was February 1988. I arrived with my wife and my two children, and it changed my life. Nothing I saw prepared me for what I saw at Auschwitz. It also is something that my wife and particularly my children were truly moved by. And for the first time, they understood not only the Holocaust, but what it was like to be a Jew. But at that time, I looked around, I saw the exhibits. I saw the human hair that was disintegrating. I saw the leather that was drying out. I saw the shoes and utensils and things that were falling apart. And I realized that in 10 or 15 years, None of it would be there to bear witness. I came back to New York and went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and went to the Egyptian department where they, were, where they specialized in preserving things. And I found three experts in preserving hair and articles um, that were experts in it. And I asked them, Do you th would they mind spending the next six months in Auschwitz um, they at first were shocked, but I explained what it was about. By the way, none of them were Jewish, and they agreed. And then, with Ernie, Ernie Michelle and Samuel Sutanik, we went to 20 countries and raised $40 million from these countries. These were countries that were involved in, the Auschwitz, in Auschwitz, whose victims came, came there. And with that $40 million and six months in Auschwitz, I must tell you, I spent two and a half weeks there. And I still don't realize how people could survive in the cold there, what they wore. But at the end of that time, the hair, the articles, the leather, it's all there. And it's, it has not moved. We also put things on the cement so the men would not fall down. And the various parts of the barbed wire and the various fences were all made so that they would not fall apart. And I visited Auschwitz about, I guess about six months ago, and it was like it was in 1988. And I think it's, some, it's something that I am most proud of because of the fact that the millions of people who come there can actually witness what happened. But I'd like to tell another story about um, Poland. When I first came to Poland, I came to the synagogue, and there were about four or five old men there. Um, old is becoming much older as I get older, but uh, they were in their 40s. No. <laughs> uh, and they were telling me that there are no Jews left in Poland, a few thousand. And then by chance I was speaking to somebody, Rabbi Haskell Besser, who told me about the hidden children. And it turned out a story. Um, we know between September 1st, 1939 and January 1st, 1943, approximately 70,000 Jewish children between the ages of one month and 14 or 15 years old were given to Catholic families and Catholic institutions for safekeeping, 70,000. We know that from baptismal records. They were, they were baptized in the, in the church. We know during the war, 20,000 were found and killed. We know after the war, another 20,000 came out, many of them left, some stayed, but there were still 30,000 unaccounted for. What we found out is over the years, starting the 1970s, what happened is that their foster parents, as they got older and ready to die in Catholics, brought them in and said to their children, we have a confession to make you're Jewish. Even though we raised you as a Catholic, 
Your parents were Jewish. They wanted so-called to clean the slate. For many of these children, particularly in small towns throughout Poland, it was a major shock. Many of the children, by the way, were women because of the circumcision and what, what had the, the boys, a lot of them were found. But what happened is that this story was told to me by Rabbi Bessa. And I said, look, take the next year or two as much as you can and travel around Poland, going to a lot of these towns. Rabbi Bessa left Poland on September 1st, 1939 and spoke Polish fluently, obviously a native. And each place we put an ad in the paper, if you found out you were Jewish, come to such and such a hotel. And in place after place after place, sometimes they found five, sometimes they found 20, sometimes they found two. But sometimes they found in Katowice 156. And slowly but surely, we ended out with 3,280 children. Today it's over 6,000. But this was in the 1980s. And it so happened, I was in Poland in 1988 with Malcolm and his parents. The fact is, we had a room in then the major hotel in Poland, the Hotel Victoria. And it was evening and we had a dinner. And we had a big horseshoe table, not so much bigger than this room you're standing in. And there were 100 children. I mean, they were now in their 30s and 40s, um, some of them even older. Um, and they were the ones who came in at 7.30. We had kosher food brought in from Vienna and Brooklyn. It was interesting bringing kosher food over. But uh, frankly, um, by 9.30, nothing had happened. The children, they were there. Everyone felt very much ill at ease and they were whispering to each other because they didn't know what to do. So I brought Haskell Besser in the corner and I said, what would a Jewish mother have sung to their children as infants? What is the equivalent to Rockabye Baby? He said, what's Rockabye Baby? Uh, so I, I said, let's leave that. And what would a mother have sung? He said, very interesting. It's Rose Against Mitmanlin. Raisins and almonds. So we did a quick rehearsal. His Yiddish was a little better than mine. Uh, and we got there, and he said to the group in Polish, We're going to sing a love song. Anyone who knows it, please join in. We started to sing. He sang, and I sort of went along. And first five, then 10, then 20, then 40, then 70, 80 out of the 100 children, uh, uh, young men and women, started singing the song. It was in their subconscious. And they sang it not as adults, but as children. And it was like a dam bursting. And when we got to uh, Shloff, Yidel Shloff, I they must tell you, I think that you could hear the emotions and feel the emotion. Um, and frankly, from that point on, from 9.30 on, I still get goosebumps when I think of it. They sat there and they started opening up, telling stories about what happened. And we sat there from 9.30 to 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning, listening to people's stories and they started to open up. And these are the people who are today some of our teachers, some of, our, some of the people who run our newspapers and involved very, very much. It was interesting because a lot of them were uh, female and a lot of them came home to the husband and said, guess what, I'm Jewish and guess what, all our kids are Jewish. That was the beginning. And today in Poland, where's Elise? Is she there? Elise Liebman? There she is. 
we now have a school, a major school in Warsaw. Elise was the principal of the school. Um, and uh, she and her husband worked together, and they still live in Warsaw. And we could see the beginnings. And today, there is a vibrant Jewish community in Warsaw, thanks to Rabbi Bess's belief, but thanks to the indomitable spirit of the Jewish people. Very often, when people come for the March of the Living, they first come to Warsaw, and they're very often welcomed in our, in our different facilities there. And it's amazing to see. And very often, for the March of the Living, which I've done also many times, um, many of them come along, not because of any other reason, but to explain to people what it's like that there is a Jewish population in Warsaw and, and in uh, Poland in general. And it's interesting because the pride they take in being Jewish, not only in Poland, but throughout Eastern Europe, is something that we all can learn from. That there's a certain pride because they know what it's like. And I must tell you, the March of the Living is important not only for the Polish people to see, but for the people, the young people who march to understand. You cannot understand what it's like to be Jewish until you've been to Poland, until you understand what Auschwitz and Birkenau was like. And for the organizers of the March of the Living, I thank you, for, and mainly the contributors and the people who are here. You don't realize the service you're doing to these young people, and it's so special, because without your help, the March of the Living would not be the same. I thank you all for coming. Um, I'm delighted to host everybody, and um, again, you do me great honor by being here. Thank you. I'd now like to invite up Dr. Shmuel Rosenman, the founder and international chairman of the March of the Living, to make a very special presentation to Ambassador Lauder on behalf of the March of the Living. Good evening. There is many philanthropists in the Jewish world today, and Ambassador Lauder is among most well-known. But in addition to your celebrated generosity, Mr. Ambassador, I would like to add another descriptive word, visionary. There is no one in the Jewish world today who has displayed both enormous generosity and such exceptional vision and wisdom with the respect to the Jewish communities of Eastern Europe. Before anyone else did, you saw both the pressing need and the tremendous potential of these struggling Jewish communities, once ravaged by twin evils, the Nazi Holocaust and the communist occupations. Your generosity, Mr. Ambassador, and vision has literally transformed the lives of the entire Jewish communities in Eastern Europe and has brought hope and light to thousands of Jews, young and old. Mr. Ambassador, you have helped rekindle the flame of Jewish life in these very same communities that our, that our young students always during the march visits each year. It is, in, it is in this recognition and sincere admiration of these extra, extraordinary efforts. We would like to honor and to present you with 2013 March of the Living Global Ambassador for Jewish, for Jewish Renewal World. You are an inspiration to us of all. Really, Mr. Ambassador, we would like to thank you on behalf of all March of the Living marchers during the year. Thank you very much. The International March of the Living 2013 Tribute to Life Award presented to Ambassador Ronald S. Lauder, visionary, humanitarian, philanthropist, in honor of your steadfast support of Jewish education, rebirth of Jewish life in Eastern Europe, and future of the Jewish people worldwide. Signed, Shlomo Grafman, Vice Chairman, signed, Phyllis Greenberg Heidemann, Chairman, International Advisory Board, and also Dr. Shmuel Rosenman, Chairman and CEO. Remembering the past, ensuring the future. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.